Welcome to 30 Experts in 30 Days, where we help entrepreneurs attract legions of loyal customers, build successful businesses, and make a difference by sharing hard-won wisdom from experts on the topics of attracting customers, cultivating customer relationships, serving our customers better, and more. Today, we're talking with Joseph Michelli, Chief Experience Officer at the Michelli Experience. Joseph's a respected speaker and organizational consultant focusing on helping businesses improve the customer experience. He's also the best-selling author of multiple books, including The Zappos Experience, The New Gold Standard, The Starbucks Experience, and more. These books help entrepreneurs learn from great examples like Starbucks and Zappos and the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company and other businesses to create great experiences for their own customers. Thank you for coming, Joseph. Thank you, Leah. It's good to be here. Excellent. So to start out, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got involved in writing and consulting about the customer experience? You know, I, I'm a classic entrepreneur, I guess. I uh, got a, a degree in something not necessarily related uh, and found that I didn't really want to work uh, for corporate America all of my life except through my, the lens of my own business. So mm -hmm. um, I got a PhD in clinical psychology with a focus on systems and did consulting in graduate school and mm -hmm. got involved as a psychologist doing actual mental health shrink stuff. Uh, and then at some point I got more and more involved in doing presentations and consulting in organizations and helping the hospital system that I was working for deal mm -hmm. with its challenges. And before you know it, I was out in the marketplace uh, no longer doing one-on-one -on -one therapy and, and only doing consulting and speaking and writing. Excellent, excellent. Well, can you maybe to start out, explain to us why the customer experience, because that's kind of your focus. Why is that so important to you? Well, you know, in general, I think it's important to every business owner. When we talk about customer experience, so it's like boiling the ocean. It's everything that affects the customer. It's the mm -hmm. perceptions of the customer from the moment they have, in, you know, even an awareness of the possibility of your brand all the way to the time they put their money in your cash register and, and there's an opportunity to have them come back again. So mm -hmm. I think for me, it's always been an, an interest because you can make money with great products and not really care too much about how you serve them or what kind of experience you wrap around them. Um, and you can also make money just being a good service provider. We have great products and you're consistent, rock solid in the way you deliver service. Or you can do something else that creates loyalty and engagement of customers. And I think with a psychological mindset about how do you get inside of the head of people and make sure that you're in a good relationship with them, um, it certainly is what I, I do, and it's what a lot of colleagues of mine do to try to help businesses go beyond just ordinary to do something, I think, extraordinary in their loyalty capacity. Oh, it's interesting how you come from the psychology background, which certainly, I think, gives you a real asset in this sort of work. Excellent. Yeah, well, yeah it's been good for me. <laughs> Can you describe maybe three or four of the critical mistakes made by you know, most customer, most entrepreneurs and businesses in dealing with the customer experience? Well, I think in general, the biggest mistake we almost always make is we assume we know more than we do. And until we get into trouble, we don't reach out. So I think uh, availing yourself to the resources that are out there, and many of which are very inexpensive. You don't necessarily have to hire uh, big time consultants like you know Fortune 500 companies do. But I think just availing yourself to all types of resources about it is the most important first step. And it's often a big mistake. We don't even realize what we don't know until we're in the thick of it. I think the other piece of this is that they don't work from the inside out. You know, sometimes they'll do one tactic or they'll have a customer service strategy or they'll you know they'll do something for a short period of time and they'll move on to something else. Um, that catches their fancy or they'll read a book and they'll, they'll do the fish thing and then they'll do the carrot thing and then they'll do whatever. And it's just a sea of uh, patchwork. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a second mistake. I think, you know, additionally, a couple of others that people tend to make is that they don't understand that operational excellence isn't enough. You can be really rock solid and that's really table stakes today. Unless you differentiate yourself with some kind of unique experience that's authentic to who you are, um, you don't stand out. And I think beyond that, and it ties in, is that if you don't really stand for something as a brand, that customers really get bored with you and you become pretty cardboard. And so it becomes important to figure out what is your soul, what is your core. And, and I think that ties to the final thing, and that is that people don't take mission, vision, and value seriously. So you often see that those are kind of thrown in there because they had to do it for a business plan to get funding. But it's not really the way things get done, and they don't operate their business from a soul. It's not the foundation of it all. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, you know, we all make mistakes with customer experience and fall short at times, um, you know, with customer service delivery. What are some ways you've seen Zappos and some of the other co companies you've researched take those failures and turn them into benefits and assets in building that customer relationship better? Well, first off, I think it's encouraging your people to make mistakes. And I say that in the sense that if, you don't, if you're really not making mistakes, you're probably playing a little too safe in the, mo in the modern business world we live in today. Things are changing so rapidly. You have to chase some opportunities and sometimes you have to bail on them pretty quickly. Um, and if your people aren't doing anything that's innovative or creative and trying to solve the problems of the customers, you probably have a, that's your first big mistake. Uh, I think Zappos and and many of the other companies that I work with make lots of mistakes. Most of the time now, because of their scale, they can make them in small pockets so you don't see them. So Starbucks can try something in a small market, for example, and most of us will never know that the product tanked, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then some of the greater products can actually move forward. Um, I, you know, at Zappos, for example, one of the big mistakes they made early on is they had a, a they have a discount arm, which is called 6 p.m. And at 6 p.m., they literally mispriced everything uh, from a price reduction standpoint mm -hmm. on the website. And the easy way to handle it, and a lot of entrepreneurs would simply say, look, we made a mistake. We're so sorry. Here's a 10% discount on future purchases. But we're going we're gonna to invalidate all the purchases that you made in the context of this obvious pricing error. Um, but they didn't. They honored that to the customer. It took a big hit to them from a cost perspective. It was in keeping with their promise to do what mm -hmm. we like by customers at all times. And I think when you make decisions like that and customers realize you care about them as much as you care for them, um, you see that those turn away from mistakes into great breakthroughs for brands. So how do you think entrepreneurs as a whole can learn from those lessons in taking their mistakes and you know turning them into relationship building opportunities? Yeah, I think particularly if you're making a mistake in service delivery, if you know you wanted red and I gave you blue, um, and you kind of bring that to my attention, I'm say, I'm so busy, I don't even realize that the, that the product didn't meet your expectations, and you share that with me. I think one of the first things we have to do is honor that as our fault, not blame the customer, not make it difficult for the customer to make the return. Yes, it's a cost of doing business. Yes, you eat, you know, assuming for some reason the product was consumable or perishable, I lose the value of that, the first product that I gave to you. But I think it's really doing the right thing by the customers and assuming that most people want fairness and are reasonable. And in the cases where people aren't, you can manage them uh, appropriately. But for service recovery, I pretty much honor what the customer says. And if it's a problem, we fix it. And, you know, that's when that's when great companies show up is how they respond to to the mistakes or the breakdowns that they have in their service delivery. Yeah. And it, is, it really can be an opportunity to, you know, really make that connection with customers because often with a lot of the business, if we're doing it online, sometimes the only time we hear from customers <laughs> is when there is something wrong. And so taking that opportunity to connect, we can either have be a negative or a positive experience. And well, I think anytime somebody says I've done something wrong, you know, it, it has an initial psychological recoil, like really? I mean, I, I want to defend myself, I want to justify, I want to mm -hmm. explain all the reasons it happened, you know, supply chain, a vendor, somebody, you know, it wasn't me. And I think that when you don't do that, it shocks people, right? Because so mm -hmm. often they're accustomed to that. They've almost got their argument built up to, yeah, to make or why they have a legitimate complaint. And once you disarm that, say, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry, that should have never happened to you. Let's get this right for you right now. What can I do to make it right? And once you say that, you know, you often take the sting out, the relationship turns around. They're like, whoa, this is great. They're actually standing up. And um, and oftentimes, if you put, the, put it back on them, you know, what can we do to make it right? You frequently find that people will ask for something maybe even less than you were willing to give. Well, mm -hmm. and, and I think if you do then just something slightly more than what they expected, then you really win their business. And I think slightly is important. I mean, there's a lot of psychological theory out there that says if you do too much more than what they expected, then they start looking at you like you're kind of a fool, like you were <laughs> yeah. you kind of over compensated. And mm -hmm. I don't think they feel very good about doing business with people who they don't think have good business judgment. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Now, there are obviously costs with taking care of those business mistakes. Right. But what are the costs if we don't take care of those business mistakes well? 
they're so silent, right? You can hardly tell, but it's, you know, there, there's been a lot of work on the cost of customer churn and the impact of negative customer communications. And I think, you know, you live in a digital world and, you know, you're, you help people a lot through the information you impart. And I think, you know, your core from what I've been able to understand is that to not market yourself, but really add value. I think when you detract value from the equation in a customer relationship, it's going to, it's going to bite you somewhere along the way. Uh, you may not, know it but those conversations migrate uh, you, see, you see that brands are really nothing more than what people say about us when we're not around so if you give them lots of things to say about you that you don't want to hear online you're gonna hear them online um, yeah. and it's gonna affect a lot of purchase decisions from yet to be buyers yeah because they really do spread online nowadays so yeah. one complaining customer can can be quite vocal yeah, people have these numbers like, you know, you'll tell 20 people if you're, you know, you're upset with the brand. I don't know that we know exactly. I just know that we have a need to tell stories, both good and bad. Yes. Um, we've been telling stories since the beginning of humanity. And I think that as a brand, we want them to tell the stories of the experience that we want them to have. And if we keep hearing that, you know, it was warm, nurturing, thought provoking, transformation, whatever we want our brand to be about, mm -hmm. then we know that the, the experience is matching up to our brand promise and our brand pillars and our brand is alive and well in the customer experience. Mm -hmm. Well, and certainly Zappos has been strong in that regard. You know, if you, if anybody's read the Zappos experience, I mean, there's many great stories that you share, you know, about, you know, um, one of the ones I liked was how the one customer, uh, you know, the what did they call them? Customer loyalty team members, basically the right. phone reps, um, right. ended up on the phone with one older woman for like seven and a half hours. Right. And she didn't even buy anything. But when asked about it, she said, if I serve well, sales will take care of themselves. And, you know, you have other stories about the customer service rep finding out that one of the customers, her mother had died. And the people, you know, all the employees pitched in and sent flowers or, a boy sent a note asked, you know, for a homework assignment on feedback and, you know, they gave him all this, you know, they sent him a book and signed it and, you know, really reached out and those create real lifetime customers. But to entrepreneurs and businesses who say, well, you know, that kind of effort into, you know, building relationships, it's just not profitable. You know, is it too costly? Is kindness just a nice idea or can you really build a business on it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it definitely couldn't be costly if you don't know how to manage costs in general, right? I mean, you can, you can blow money on kindness, you can blow money on meanness, you know. Uh, <laughs> you can send all kinds of nasty letters to customers and expend a great deal of money in a wasteful way there, too. I, I think that, you know, the real question comes down to how much does it cost to be kind? And, it, you know, I think your mama probably told you and my mama told me it doesn't cost a whole bunch more to be kind than it does to be mean. And I think fundamentally in business, that's true. Um, if you don't have a lot of money to do customer relationship management, um, then you probably have note cards on your customers. You jot down notes of their preferences. You might jot down their birthday. You might send them a birthday card on their birthday. Yeah, that's uh, now this, the ever increasing cost of of that, maybe you just send them an email if you have their email. So that's mm -hmm. reduced our cost substantially there other than the time it takes to craft an email. Uh, probably better if you're really, really thrifty just to have a stock email that you send out to people on their birthday and put the right name in. It's probably better than nothing. I mean, it depends mm -hmm. on how much you want to invest. But my point is the brand that doesn't acknowledge someone on their birthday is beat by the brand that does in a generic sense. The brand that acknowledges you on your birthday in a more personalized week way beats the brand that's more generic. And if you get down to the point where you really know your customer and you're connecting with them in a meaningful, knowing way, um, then you're way ahead of those who are too busy and too disregarding their customer. And ultimately customers, you know, they want to be cared about. I want to be cared about. We all want a brand to actually think we matter. And um, those that do tend to hold us. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we balance, you know, efficiency and, and I think you've kind of talked about it, balancing efficiency in customer service. Well, but I think, you you know, it's important to be efficient in customer service, you know, and it's important to know who your customers are. So you're targeting those customers. I don't try to be all things to all people. Um, I don't do a lot of Facebook because my customers aren't on Facebook with me. I do a lot of LinkedIn. So mm -hmm. from an efficiency standpoint, I'd rather manage my relationship community through that particular channel because that's where my customers tend to be. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I do feel a certain sense of guilt not having a real big corporate Facebook presence. Yet when it gets right down to it, that's an inefficient way for me to spread my resource uh, 
out into whatever is the digital world. So I think you have to start knowing where your customers are, what they want, need, and desire, who are the customers that are going to bring you to the dance and keep you in the dance. And you need to put your energy there. And once you've defined who they are and listen to them as to what they want, need, and desire, build a deliverables that are consistent with it, stay in regular communication with them about changes of their wants, needs, and desires. I think that's how you do it, you know, and you mm -hmm. only have some really cool idea you want to throw on top of it. But but you, it's a lot of hard execution work to deliver great experiences. It's like delivering great products plus delivering great service plus delivering great emotional engagement. And mm -hmm. so um, you have to be efficient in making it happen. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I think it always, just like you said, in building this, you need to know your brand and your vision, your message. I think also to be efficient, you really do need to know your customer. Because if you try to focus on providing service or products and you really don't know who they are, where to find them, where to connect with them and what their real problems are and needs, then you are, you're going to be doing it all over the place. and only a certain portion of it will be effective. And there's a certain aspirational customer too who may be on the fringe. You need to know them so you can make sure that you're bringing your brand along and keeping it relevant. So mm -hmm. you know, I look at Starbucks as a constant example. They keep very effectively owning young demographics as well as owning their core stock demographics. So people who have a lot of discernible income and can spend four bucks for a cup of coffee on a regular basis, is the core of their brand. But there are a lot of young people that they want to continue to keep that brand technologically relevant, edgy, cool, and also meet the customers where they are through mobile technology or mobile pay. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example. So I, I think it is knowing who you are and knowing who your customers are and who you're future customers are likely to be. Well, I was, as you were saying it, that's what it was making me think is you've got to think into the future. And if you're not addressing the customers who will become your customers, um, you will have a time limit. Yeah, I, I heard somebody who told me that they came in as CEO and the age of their core customer was this was 10 years older than their pro previous CEO who had been there for 10 years, meaning in essence mm -hmm. that their customers had just gotten 10 years older. They hadn't really shifted the balance to get a new Graphic. And I think if you start to ever see that in, a, in an entrepreneurial business, you realize you are going to somehow uh, become a dinosaur in the end. Mm -hmm. And it happens faster nowadays, I think, often. <laughs> in hours. <laughs> yes. Now, Zappos believes that everyone is a customer. Um, can you share with us what they mean by this, how they put it into practice, and you know the effect it has on their company? Yeah, well, I'm one of my favorite ways of putting it into practice. If you were to go to Las Vegas, I was just there last week, um, and you go into City Hall now, the headquarters are there, and people go and visit Zappos headquarters, and all it is is a call center, as you put it. I mean, it's it's a place where they take orders predominantly, and they manage the rest of the business, but you're going in to see a bunch of people on phones answering calls from consumers. Mm -hmm. So who in the world goes there? You know, I mean, who would want to go on a tour of this place? Well, they've made it incredibly fun and engaging and people do go and there's a lot of hooping and hollering, a lot of chanting and cowbells and all kinds of fun stuff. So when people do do the tour, they'll and tell friends, hey, when you're in Vegas, of all places, Vegas, this incredibly exciting place, why don't you go to a tour of a call center? Right? And not everyone, not everyone who goes on this tour is a customer of Zappos. But mm -hmm. after they've done the tour, they're more likely to explore the product. And, and the, the gist of this really is that if you treat a vendor uh, like they're a fulfillment object and they're just nothing to you and, mm -hmm. and you're yelling and screaming at them because you don't like the way they're pricing product for you, well, that vendor could well, very well have bought the, the final product from you, right? Yes. But it's probably less inclined to do so and probably inclined to tell their family that you're very difficult to deal with and their family probably has family. And before you know it, you've really started to pollute the waters so in which you do business. And I think the key here is that whether they're vendors, whether they're employees, whether they're the children of current customers, they're all your customers. Uh, as long as you see that to be true, you create opportunities to make it so. Because they're potentially future customers or sure. customer marketers, or I guess you could say anti-marketers. <laughs> yeah, detractors. As you know, in the net promoter score world, we talk about them as detractors. They're the ones who are out there saying things that steer people away from your business. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Okay. Now, many customers, I mean, companies spend a lot of time on advertising, you know, with limited effectiveness. Um, especially when their service maybe doesn't match up to the advertising that they, you know, the message they say. But other customers focus more on creating customer evangelists. Um, 
you know, do you want to just share a little bit, what is customer evangelism and how does it compare to traditional advertising? In, in the world of customer experience designers, we think of customer evangelists as a part of your marketing team. They are the customers who are so loyal to you that they can't imagine a world without you. They are, they are in love with you, and, and love is an important variable in business. If you don't think so, I'd, I'd encourage you to read you know, Jim Autry's book on you know, kind of love and profits, for example. But for me, it comes down to this. If, if I can get a customer to say, wow, that brand is so right for me. I mean, it's perfect for someone like me and I can't imagine without that brand. Then suddenly they take on a whole different characteristic. So let's pretend you've never been to Starbucks and I love Starbucks and I say to you, you got to go try this place out. I can't believe you've been on the planet, you know, all 20 years of your life uh, and that you haven't been there, but please go and you go and you come back to me, you tell me I didn't get it. I didn't like it. It kind of stunk. I don't understand why a tall is a small and what's a person. <laughs> all confused and and you're you're upset and I would look at you and go really I mean really I, I don't know who I'm hanging out with anymore if you're my friend and you can't get mm -hmm. Starbucks right so essentially I'm throwing you under the bus before I throw my brand under the bus you know I care my brand is so beloved that any supposed friend of mine who doesn't love them like I love them there's something wrong with that person and I think we do forge relationships with brands are that strong and if they are like a family member to us, if they're an extension of our own identity, our own lifestyle, then frankly, those customers who have that as so tell other people and they get other people on fire about it. And I'll tell you, it's much better. So I'm a brand fan of Sonos, you know, this wireless technology speaker systems in your house. And so I love them, right? And, and I tell everybody I know how much I love my system and I explain how I didn't have to pre-wire my house. And, you know, I can have music and different. I'm like, I am better as a salesperson to my friends than anyone from Sonos could be, you know, because mm -hmm. Sonos is going to have this need to push a product at you and it's going to sound like blah, blah, blah. And uh, you know, the millennials are going to say, yeah, right. Show me, prove to me that that's so, because everybody's claiming everything all the time and it just, it's not going to live up. But you know, if peer to peer, oh yeah. Okay. Let me check it out. Right. Well, so, you're more trustworthy, you know, from a friend point than a salesperson. Yeah, absolutely. And, and online, sometimes we take referrals from strangers, product consumers. We don't even know. And they seem. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. now we're starting to worry sometimes that they're actually just paid spokesperson, <laughs> you know, pretending yes. to be uh, objective observers. But yeah, I, you know, I think the key to what you're saying is that customer evangelists are that group of customers who are part of your marketing advertising team. And they're that because they love your brand and they love the experiences your brand and how your brand fits with them and their lifestyle. So, uh, it, and I think that's a much more effective way to market today than it was a decade ago when mm -hmm. advertising dominated us, when we had you know a lot more focus on set TV and radio ads. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it also, once again, goes back to your discussion of the vision and mission and your values. And I think sometimes why people become customer evangelists is because your values match theirs and so they're like oh yeah you're you're me you're one of mine you know and so they um and i clear on those values you know it, starbucks is a great example of this in the sense that you know they're very kind of a liberal positive relational everyone's lifestyle is acceptable kind of value structure and they are in seattle they're it's perfectly right for their employer base it's perfectly right for their consumer base and it's really who they are so when someone like Howard Schultz takes out a full page ad in the, in the Wall Street Journal and says don't send money to politicians they're gonna pander for your votes this is in the last election cycle they're not gonna create jobs and we need to create jobs we absolutely need to employ the youth of America and then he creates a program that creates small business loans he creates a program where you know we're really focused on generating jobs and it's you know it's this united and this undivided campaign and you can buy your wristband and every five dollars you get the wristband and you're able to put that five dollars directly into this seed money for small business you know you take a lot of hit from from stockholders who say why are you getting political on us right i mean why are you doing this to us howard and and in truth it's because they stand for something and those small business loans literally propelled little ice cream shops like gelato fiasco up in Maine to open more stores and hire more people. 
directly across from Starbucks, even when the gelato fiasco stores were selling coffee. Um, and then gelato fiasco just so happens to get successful enough that they donate proceeds from one of their ice cream products that they've inserted into the supermarkets into the same fund and they pay it forward. And you start to say, well, you know what? I think that was a much better move. Because in the end, it's not as self-serving as, serving as it appears, right? I mean, unless youth have money, they can't buy $4 coffees. So there's a need for this from a business life cycle perspective. But most brands are just like apolitical. They don't want to stand for anything. They don't want to mean anything. Um, and so the customers that they would resonate with find them to be boring and bland. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think there's a lot said in what you, what you were alluding to. Yeah. Well, and I think with that, to your point, that while he took that step and it may have turned a few people off, once again, we're not, we can't try to succeed in marketing by trying to market to everyone. We right. really do need to stay focused on our target group because if we don't stay focused on them, we become vanilla and nobody connects with us. So, so I respect Chick-fil-A and Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though they're probably on the polar opposites. <laughs> Right. But because I think in each case, they know who they are, their brands are strong in the context of their identity. Um, do I agree with them? I, I agree with neither of them in terms of all of their political decisions. Probably. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I know that those brands are coming from a, a voice and a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and I think that really, I, I firmly agree with you in the fact that too often nowadays, I don't want to go too deep into this, but you know, we have a tendency in social media that whatever stance you have, people have a tendency to really attack it if they don't agree with you. And, you know, so sometimes people feel a need to be more vanilla to avoid, you know, offending people. Right. But I think truthfully, I firmly do believe you need to be who you are, that's you know, right. whether an individual or a business. Yeah, it's that realness. I think that's at core here. And I think then you have to be very respectful for people who aren't who aren't you. Absolutely. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's being welcoming, it's being gracious, it's being authentic, it's being who you are and respecting who they are. And you know, mm -hmm. I find that that is the success for most successful businesses that I see anyway, in, in that respect for others, but clarity of who you are. Because it's gonna attract all the people like you and the people who are not like you, as long as you're inquisitive and eager and willing to learn and not to be too righteous about everything, um, I think it attracts them too. Well, and my hope would be we can do more of that as a whole in society too. But as and a business, as, I, mean, as, I mean, I think it's, you know, we try to stay away from business in real life sometimes, and, and I think it doesn't work. I mean, people want to do business with people. It, you know, every business is personal. That's the way I look at mm -hmm. it, right? everything yes, yes. Is, it's about you it's you know and if we don't treat it that way um you know it's not about the business itself we're here yes. to serve we're serving people yeah so exactly. it is about people yeah. yeah um now there are um sorry what are the top three things that small business entrepreneurs can learn from zappos about you know employee training and personal development you know you touched yeah. on that a fair bit in there and you know, while that's internal, um, and we're more, more focusing, you know, as far as this project about, you know, serving our customers and knowing them, if we don't prepare our people, ourselves, and our employees, um, we're not gonna be able to serve the customers better. So how does Zappos do it? And what can we learn from them? Well, you know, the beauty of the Zappos example is it does apply greatly to entrepreneurs because they don't spend a lot of money, but they do a lot of training, right? So how do you do a lot of training and not spend a lot of money? Well, one of the easiest ways is to have a bunch of business books and read them yourselves as leaders, you know, really take some time to know what's out there to make business better. And when something resonates with you, make them available to your people, inspire them mm -hmm. to do groups uh, have that as part of their development plan and maybe that's one of the first things you can do is just realize that every human being needs to develop in the context of their work with you uh, so you need to sit with them and talk with them about how they're performing and what they're doing and what they want to do and what their dreams are both in business and in life and I think the more you can help a, you know a, a employee realize their success in life or business the more they're gonna help you realize yours. If it's all about you and you tell them, here's my vision for the future and we're gonna be you know, making X billions of dollars by blankety blank, and the average employee is going like, and what's in it for me really? And I'm really grand and that's kind of exciting, but I have no real interest in it. When I take more time to be interested in you as an employee, I know about your kids, I know about you know, your family, I know what you know inspires you, I know what you really wanna have happen in your personal life, your professional life, your social life. 
If I know those things in a way that I try to help you achieve them, uh, then I think you're more interested in knowing about my dream and what I might want to have happen and how you can partner and help us make that happen in the context of our business. So I think Zappos does that really well. They use cheap resources like books and encourage people to do it. They spend a lot of time trying to understand what it takes to be successful at each level of the organization. So if you're, you've got a clerk, what does it take for them to be a successful store manager? They help clerks understand the kinds of training they're going to need to be effective in store managing. They may need to be involved in the community more. They might encourage people to go out and spend more time volunteering in the community or shadow a manager. Mm -hmm. So I think they spend a lot of time looking at that pipeline to success in all levels of the business so that if all the managers left tomorrow, they would be developing their bench strength with their existing staff and building those skill sets necessary to replace the lost level of talent. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very, I mean, I've, been a manager for many a years and try just going through the process of losing someone and having to hire a new and get them retrained is very costly. And, you know, especially when you're in the middle of major projects. So trying to keep them and make them better. Cause I've certainly been in companies where, um, you know, they promote you to manager director with pretty much zero training right. and then wonder why, you know, management struggles. And Absolutely. so, you know, really giving that support. Now Zappos actually took it a step further and not just training their own people, but they've actually created a whole training department, well, training company for other companies, correct? Absolutely. And, and you know, that happens to a lot of these great service brands because service for as easy as it really is, you just have smart people who know what about the product, fix it first time, deliver it. A lot of great service brands are so different than the way we experience service that a lot of companies are going to them to learn. So Ritz Carlton mm -hmm. has a leadership training arm on how to do great customer experience, and so does Zappos now. And uh, I'm, you know, writing a book about Mercedes Benz. Uh, they went from number seven to number one in sales satisfaction recently over the last couple of years, and have been consulting for them um, during that time window. And so. You know, I envision them potentially being hit up somewhere down the road on how do you deliver service and having a training arm. So, yeah, they, mm -hmm. they went to that extreme at Zappos. So you can go there and learn how they do what they do and how you could do it more effectively in your company. Excellent. Okay. Now, if anyone's heard about Zappos, they probably heard about their fun working environment. Um, what can we learn from Zappos about, you know, having fun while still also getting the job done? Yeah, well, yeah, I think you have to play with a purpose. And I think the problem is a lot of us think of play as the antithesis to work. And so figuring out how do you get someone to see that if you perform, you should be able to reward yourself with play, right? I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. play so you don't produce profitability, but it's really <laughs> playing as a result of being profitable and being in a connected community and enjoying what you do and enjoying who you do it with uh, increases mm -hmm. the likelihood you're going to be. Uh, productive and profitable. So I think Zappos has really figured that out. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I've written now eight books, so sometimes I forget my principles, but I think it was play to win. And I think it, it is about, you know, winning. It's about succeeding and using play as a, a, a impetus to make that happen and, and not viewing it as your enemy. So they'll do, you know, uh, minute to win it sort of activities in a morning lineup or morning stand-up activity and so they'll do some game and then they'll go off and do their work or they'll set some performance objective and if the performance objective is met then the team has already picked what the manager must do um, if the team's able to be that productive and so you know we have you see you know managers walking around in gnome outfits and you know, <laughs> pictures taken and it's very humiliating to have to you know have your team be so successful but it's the kind of humiliation that you can take to the bank and uh, mm -hmm. And I think we get over our serious sense of ourself and just play, uh, you know, I think we can, we can do a little bit more productively with our teams and our teams like being around us. You know, if people have to play when you leave the room, that's probably a bad sign. You bad know, sign. You want to be in the room when they're playing and then yeah. let's get on to doing something else too. Well, and I think what goes with it um, in the book, you also talk about how with Zappos, they, after some time discovered that, they really needed to be more careful about who they hired, that they were, that they hired people that really matched their values and right. their beliefs and their way of doing things. Because at first they were just had, they were outsourcing some of the, you know, talent searching and just started discovering they were hiring people that weren't a good match. And so if you want to have a fun working environment, but then you have a bunch of people who 
you know, you just don't naturally relate to, it's probably going to be harder naturally. I just, I'm, I'm actually in this moment, I just got to step aside and just say, it's so refreshing to have somebody who's actually read your books. I, you probably read my book more recently than I have. I mean, I've written a few since then, but you know, it's just delightful when people actually read your books. So thank you. <laughs> you know, to, to, and I think you're, you know, the people who follow you should really be appreciative of that. I mean, I, I think a lot of what you see online are people who don't dedicate a real craft to this. And so congratulations on that. And, and you're a blessing to those who serve. You know, as it relates to specifically what you said uh, about that, I think it's the most critical thing you can do in, as a leader. And it's the thing you don't normally get until later on. You have to find people who share your worldview on how this should look and how it should feel to your customers. And if they don't, they're going to mistreat customers. They're going to, they're going to have, sh you know, kind of shoddy business practices and it'll kill you much quicker than having nobody in the position, right? I mean, it's better to have mm -hmm. crickets and nobody occupying a desk than having a person who's toxic in your work environment. So I think, you know, Zappos really try to figure out what is their core, what were the core values, one of which is to, you know, have fun and, and to be a little weird. Um, and it was true. I mean, this, these, Zappos is not your three-piece suit button-down kind of company. It is unconventional. And so people who thrive there really like to play. They're, you know, they're a lot of tatted up, heavily pierced, uh, intensely brilliant people. Uh, I've often called them the land of misfit toys, you know, but <laughs> you just knew in high school if they ever got it together socially and weaved together in some kind of community, they would take over the world. Um, it is Zappos. And they figured out that, you know, they were a little weird and they kind of liked it. And um, people who weren't, they didn't hang well with. And so they put that in the formula and they screen for it. They screen for things like humility. So if you get past all the filtering of their interview process and you're not humble when you deal with a driver who picks you up at the airport to go to the job interview, that driver is going to give input on your hiring and you're not going to get in. And so I think the more as entrepreneurs we think about uh, the talents, the fit, the personality that we need to make this work and the more we hold that to be sacred and we tell our team that they're responsible for helping us make sure there are no interlopers who come in here who aren't what we are. Um, and I don't mean that in kind of gender or race or any of the other ways mm -hmm. that we can be segregated. I'm talking about core values. Do they value them? Mm -hmm. um, and if you protect that island uh, against interlopers and then you're also responsible for advancing our culture by making contributions to our value system and making us better, then you create Zappos. That's what you do. And yeah. they are a billion dollar company. You know, they sold for a billion to Amazon. They were a mm -hmm. tiny little startup that almost didn't make it. And it's a classic example of how you can create a wonderful culture um, and a solid product and really connect and resonate with your customers. So your customers do the work for you because they don't advertise much. No, they don't. Yeah, it, it has spread naturally. And I think that is a key is recognizing who you are, bringing them together. And like you said, Finding the people that match you isn't a case of saying you can't be a part of it. It's just saying this is what we stand for. Do you want to stand for this too? Yeah. And then by and then being true to your values. You know, even when times get tough, do you stick to those values or do you throw them under the bus because you've got some short term need? And um, you gotta you gotta live those values, not just spout them. And, and in support of that, you know, at Zappos, everyone goes through a protracted. Uh, enculturation process, you know, let's say a month long enculturation process. And if I am the CFO and I have come over from uh, Amazon to be the CFO over at Zappos, in most companies, you'll waive that one month cultural orientation process, right? We need that CFO in that chair helping us finance future projects. We certainly don't need them in some training course on, you know, how to be humble. Um, so let's fast track it and they don't. And that's what I think what your point is, you know, it's much more expedient for them to make exceptions around their values, but they just don't because they think that would erode the structure, the foundation, as you put it earlier, um, the foundation mm -hmm. of the business. Well, and I think especially for, you know, the C-level team, the higher the management, if you don't make sure they are true to it, they're going to be the ones most likely to, well, break down the values structure, certainly. And I've certainly been in companies where that has happened. Everybody's watching. The higher you go in the organization, more eyes watch you, you know, and are you living these values? And they're looking for you to prove that you don't really believe what you say you believe. Mm -hmm. so I then yeah. 
follow you. Um, so it takes a pretty amazing leader to handle all that scrutiny. And, and when you fail, it takes an amazing leader to say, hey, I missed it today. I wasn't really on. I'm human. But tomorrow we're going to nail it. I'm going to get this right. We're going to fix it. I shouldn't have done it this way. That's an amazing leader. Yeah. Well, and like we talked about earlier, when we make mistakes, we need to be honest with our customers. And the same is true for our employees, our vendors, anyone. You know, I, I firmly believe, you know, like you said, humility, um, you know, being an entrepreneur, sometimes it's about being an idea person and moving forward. And you have to have this courage to move forward. And some some people are OK with the risk and the failure and then get back up. Some people, I think, sometimes try to put blinders on to the failure and just push forward and we really do need to in all aspects you know be okay with making mistakes but then learning from them fast and trying to resolve them as quickly as possible and i think that you know this goes to a core message that i know underpins your brand which is i think we're so busy sometimes selling all the time all the time selling and so we don't want anybody to know that there's any glitches in our operating system. So we're this almost these imposters selling yes. all this stuff all the time. And and I think that's why I'm excited about the millennials cutting through some of that and looking for authenticity and looking for what's real. I think that we all could be better if we allowed ourselves to admit that we are not perfect as we go through this journey. I was just interviewed for a this kind of a thought leader thing where they ask you all these really intimate personal questions and you know and just odd questions here and there. And and I, would, I looked at other people who filled it, you know, completed this interview process, some really high level people. And, uh, and some of them, I was just like, please, you know, not every question has to be how, you know, brilliantly you were trained and how fabulously your products have gone. You know, at some point, just lighten up on the gas, you know, let's, uh, let's swerve a little and let's show some imperfections because you're not helping people by giving them a message that they need to just keep selling all the time right mm -hmm. well and i think also with that so true and you know sometimes you know if we're really trying to understand our customers you know the key is reaching out to them and asking them for input and asking for questions and trying to understand what they need and when we come across as we know it all um we can't then play the reaching out and admitting we don't know what they need and asking them so you 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 can't believe really both. Came, they came to you as your customer, right? So they they obviously think you have something to offer, right? So once they're there, we've already established a relationship where they see you as a credible source of something. And, and to be even more credible and to last, you have to stay relevant with your credibility. And relevance right. comes from understanding and in, inquiring and making sure that your products are, are hitting where you're intending them to go. So yeah, I think that that, it's, it's figuring out that balance between having expertise and gravitas or good product and also then having the humility and gentility and care and concern for your consumer and keeping that going, you know, both those forces going in a business and great entrepreneurs figure it out. Others just, it's all about them and, and, you know, like they never hear a customer. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Now you just finished, like you said, the latest book, um, I think it's going to be called Driven to Delight. Yes. Wow, you're way ahead of the curve. Yes. <laughs> cover approved today, so you probably already know what that looks like before I did. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, now it's a book about Mercedes Benz and how they delight their customers and how they've made these improvements. Are you open? I know the book's not coming out to this this sure. fall, but can you share us a couple things that you learned from yeah. working with Mercedes? Absolutely. You know, first off, I think my image of Mercedes was different than probably what it was. I mean, I always assume this brand had everything perfect, right? I mean, like it's Mercedes, everything's perfect. So they were pretty dang rock solid on the engineering side and the marketing side. They really have that dialed in pretty much as I expected. What I didn't realize is that first off, you know, Mercedes Benz is a bunch of things. They're mostly a a distributor model, right? So there's the manufacturer, which is based in Germany, and then there's the, the parent, the company here in the United States that represents the manufacturer's distribution in the United States. And then they've got all their dealers, um, and those dealers are not Mercedes-Benz employees. They're on a contractual relationship to distribute the product. And all the employees in those dealerships are not Mercedes-Benz employees. They're the dealership's employees. And so I get a different image sometimes when I think about the brand. And when you work in it, you try to figure out how do I get a certain experience to happen at every dealership around the world uh, with so many different ownership groups and some owners mm -hmm. own a Mercedes and they own a BMW dealership too. So 
how do you affect that owner to apply a certain kind of brand standard delivery in Mercedes differently than what they do at BMW? It was a very challenging thing. And, and I also didn't realize they were number seven in the JD Power sales satisfaction, which meant that they were really mid pack, if not low mid pack in the way customers felt about the way they were sold vehicles in Mercedes. And a lot of that had to do with arrogance around their products and you know, just being so cocky about how good they were. And so, Figuring out how to work in that environment and then seeing what they did to transform it and the incredible clarity of leadership that Steve Cannon brings to the table for that company and seeing them get to number one in J.D. Power sales satisfaction in a short period of time. I think there's a lot in that book, hopefully, for people to take away and say, this can't just be product. It can't be just marketing. It's got to be product marketing and experience of the customer. Mm -hmm. What was, do you mind sharing one of the key things that you found um, that Mer that you helped Mercedes kind of turn around um, to start that process of improving their customer service? I think you have to, you have to convince the people who are delivering services, it's not as great as they think it is. You know, if somebody brings $75,000 into a Nordstrom's and was waving it around as they walked into a Nordstrom's, hey, I got $75 to spend today. You know, a Nordstrom, you know, a clerk would tackle you. I mean, they would, they would say, "How can I help you? I'd be glad to go to your home. I'll be your buying, you know, personal shopper. We'll look at your wardrobe. We'll find what's gapping. You know, how I can get you more trendy, edgy, whatever." They would fall over themselves, um, and that attitude is much more graciously open to be of service. Not, I've got the goods, and you know, you're lucky if I give them to you. Kind of mm -hmm. so I think getting people to understand there's a problem and there's a burning platform mm -hmm. that's worth becoming excellent at was probably the beginning. And there's so much more. You know, I can tell you the most interesting thing to me was that most of the people in a Mercedes Benz dealership had never driven a Mercedes. I mean, the people in the finance department, the people in the back office, you know, they just did not have experience with the very product that they were to deliver to customers. So getting them not only to drive them, but also to be able to give them opportunities to go into an enriched cultural center where they could understand the history, they could drive them off road, they could see the high performance end of the vehicles. They could be proud of the building's logo that they worked in, even if it was another, you know, they're getting their check from their dealer. So it was very, very wonderful to watch that level of engagement of employees and how that manifested in the way they, they dealt with customers differently. Mm. So, I mean, I think for, you know, other entrepreneurs, what can we learn from that in applying in our own businesses, would you think? I think you definitely want to make sure your, customers, your employees have great experiences with your products if you're a product-based business. You know, you want your, your, customer, your employees to want to be customers of your business and you want their families to. So what are you doing to give them a taste, a sample, to share the experience with them? Are you getting them excited about the history of your company? Are you giving them something to be proud of? Um, because I think unless they feel proud, then they're vulnerable to go somewhere else. And, you know, unless you want them to go somewhere else, then you should help them move along to that career path first. But if you really love your employee, you need to have them feel special about where they work so that that carries into the way they deal with your customers. You, know, you think about it in a restaurant, it's probably the easiest way. You know, if, a cur if, if two waitresses are complaining about the ownership and you're the customer, uh, it doesn't make you really want to come back anytime soon. No, no. I mean, in a sense, you're instead of creating just customer evangelists, we need to create employee evangelists, I guess. Absolutely. They spend the most time at your, at, in the business. They're the ones who probably need to be most excited. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, to wrap up, um, I like to ask each individual, you know, that I interview to share, you know, some hard won wisdom with our guests. What's one big mistake that you've made that's cost you time and money? And what advice can you provide to our guests to help them avoid making that same mistake? Wow, there's a lot. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> business versus what I've done for somebody else, I guess. Let me start with my own business. I think I have had a challenge of staying as a strategic person. I mean, I yeah. like to get into operations. I love my operational team and they're so good. But I like to be in there doing things and fixing things. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think I've disempowered employees when I've done it. And I think I forget that, you know, I, I know Michael Gerber pretty well and his work on the E-Myth. And, um, you know, I think I make that mistake. I don't do only the things that only I can do as the entrepreneur in the business. And so every time I do it, it costs me money. Every time I do it, I'm not thinking about strategic opportunities. I am 
doing something I could pay somebody a third of what I should be getting paid to do. Um, and that's mm -hmm. silly. And I also am stealing, you know, the, the motivation of the people who work for me because I could swoop in at any time. So I, I think I'm better. You'd have to ask my people. You will. But, uh, but I, I know that I still am prone to that mistake and I made it way too mm -hmm. much. To start. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Joseph, for your personal thoughts, the thoughts about the businesses. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, the Mercedes Benz book coming out. So that'll be great. Well, maybe you'll now, have how Maybe you'll have a thousand experts in a thousand days uh, and it will be around again on the next loop when that book comes out. That would be awesome. Now, what, um, how can people find out more about you and your books? Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. It's Joseph, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-I. Uh, you can do josephmichelli.com. You can find me any number of ways. If you get my name out there, if you even put Joseph in Starbucks, you tend to find me on Google searches. So yeah, I, I welcome anyone I can help in any way. I'm, all, I'm glad to be of service. Excellent. Well, I sure do appreciate your time today, Joseph. Thank you, Leah. Have a good day. Bye now.